Um, COP26 is coming, and achieving its ambitious goals is going to require commitment, but most importantly, collaboration between diverse parties needed to make it happen. By bringing in key actors behind the European Green Deal, alongside leaders from business and science, we hope, actually it says hope, I don't think we hope, we will create an environment where boundaries can be broken down and leaders can cross-pollinate in building an inclusive agenda for sustainability in the future. Um, Felix has already announced our fabulous panel. Um, so normally we would start with ladies first, but I've had a chat with Kate and with Gail, and we've agreed to give the first floor to, De to Diedrich. Um, I haven't met Diedrich personally yet, um, but I did in preparation for this panel hear a couple of fantastic things about how the European Commission shouldn't be in the cap table of any startups, but we've actually, I'm one of the people who invested all of the Green Deal money in fantastic sustainable technologies. And I'm really excited to host Diedrich here. Diedrich, please, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. And it's great to be here at a green tech event uh, because as you said yourself, innovation is driving us forward uh, as it should. Not only innovation, uh, also regulation. Um, I'm less objective on that because we are the regulatory body of the European Union. And participation by you, uh, by people, by normal citizens uh, uh, taking their share of the burden or their share of the promise, actually. Um, let's see where we can get towards Glasgow. I think what we need to do right now as a world community is join forces. Um, we've seen on all parts of the world, on all continents, we've seen initiatives, we've seen uh, regulatory progress, we've seen innovation, but we can only get our planet Earth uh, safe for future generations if we join all those forces that we have. That's why these conferences are so important. This one, and the one we're working towards, which is called Glasgow COP26. Um, and at that conference, it needs to happen. We have only one chance in this generation to make the commitment to keep the, the temperature of the Earth within the so-called one and a half degree increase. That's our objective. And as I said, this is a unique opportunity. If we can muster all the power that we have, get the companies on board, governments on board, and most important, people on board, I'm optimistic that we can make it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, Diedrich. I would love to welcome Kate. Kate, you are um, probably of all the companies out there, my, you, you call yourself um, pretty good. Um, I, I would say you guys are trailblazers in terms of what Google is doing. So please, let's, uh, let's have a little insight in terms of all the fantastic things you are doing at Google and sustainability. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you. I had the chance to be at Green Tech for the inaugural conference in 2019. So hopefully next year, we'll be there back on the stage with you. But great to be here virtually today. Um, yes, well, you're, you're very kind to note that, of course, sustainability has truly been a core value for us at Google since our founding over two decades ago. And now in our third decade of climate action, we're really shifting away from a net zero model of you know, emit and compensate and instead targeting absolute zero, where our goal is to simply never emit carbon from our operations in the first place. And we really think about this as a moonshot objective um, on par with work that we do at Google on topics like quantum computing or self-driving cars. So our goal is that by 2030, we want to fully decarbonize the electricity that supplies our operations around the world. Mm -hmm. And I truly applaud the European Union for setting itself very ambitious climate goals. And we're very proud to be supporters of the European Green Deal, as well as some of the very important initiatives, um, such as the European Climate Pact, the European Green Digital Coalition, and of course, the UN's Race to Zero, which is critical in this lead up to COP26. And I think that reaching these climate goals 
of course, it's going to be challenging. And we very much believe that technology has a critical role to play in this theme of joining forces. I think that was so well said. Technology is going to play such an important role in this collaboration between industry, science, government to achieve really robust outcomes at COP26 and, of course, over the next decade and beyond. And we are very committed at Google to putting our technology at the forefront of innovation and to really bringing our tools and technology to helping to solve this massive global challenge of climate change. Um, so just a couple of places, and I know we'll share more on the panel, that we're really excited about our partnerships are with cities. We have a tool called the Environmental Insights Explorer, uh, where we have enabled new data for over 34 European cities about how they can do climate action planning. And also on the topic of participation, right? How do we get everyone involved? We have products that billions of people use every day, and so we want to put those in the service of climate action. Tools like Google Maps defaulting to the least carbon intensive routes. Mm -hmm. So really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, and thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much. If we may say so, Gail, um, can we say that you represent science in this panel, at least to some degree? Um, we can't do it without science. The science is out there, right? Um, we can't ignore the signs. So... Uh, oh. Well, thanks so much. I, I, I can't say that I represent all of science, but I am a professor um, and I do run an organization also called uh, Arctic Base Camp, which is a science communication outreach um, platform. And, and we run an annual event at the World Economic Forum at Davos, where we bring climate scientists and Arctic scientists to uh, speak science to power. And I'm happy to say that we've had Astra Teller um, from Moonshot Factory, uh, Kate, um, uh, with us. And and certainly we've had uh, heads of state, former heads of state. We had Greta and her dad camp with us. Lots of CEOs. And and certainly we're trying to raise um, uh, awareness that that really the, the Arctic is a barometer of, of global risk. And, and I and I do definitely think um, that the European uh, uh, Green New Deal and, and all the efforts that are, are happening from uh, governments around the world are a step in the right direction. But I'm here to give you a reality check uh, that, that despite all the good efforts, um, we are not uh, anywhere near to solving this problem in terms of actual emission out output. Um, it, the science is clear. Uh, it is uh, robust, and it shows that we are vastly close to serious tipping points where we can no longer avoid runaway climate change. We're not there yet. Um, I am a stubborn optimist, but it does mean that I have to be stubborn about that because the road is not clear. I recently published a paper together with Johan Rockström and many other uh, scientists uh, with the Potsdam Institute and other places, which really assessed the feasibility of uh, of many of the 1.5 C pathways. So can we actually get there? Or is it feasible? And 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 the results uh, from that showed that it was, uh, there was very few pathways that would be feasible to keep us within a, a safe corridor of the 1.5. And um, a, a clear message that came from that was that the Shell uh, sky scenario, which is a big corporate uh, scenario of how we reduce emissions, was clearly not in the safe place. And the problem with that is that the fossil fuel industry is has been certainly doing some positive things, but nowhere near enough. And we simply cannot uh, stay on that trajectory. I, I'm encouraged, though, uh, by, by some of the things that have recently happened by the, for example, International Energy Agency that has come out with its recent uh, report saying we can have no new fossil fuel uh, development at all, no, no new funding for that, and no new fossil fuel development um, if we want to stay within the 1.5. The, the science is clear, and, and, and I would encourage you all to take a look at what's happening in the Arctic right now. It's it's one of the key regions that's warming at over three uh, uh, times faster than other places. Uh, it's it's warming right now as we have this, this conference, and, and it's going to affect the rest of the world. It affects it through extreme weather events. We see the western U.S. Uh, again having a, a terrible uh, a fire season. We've seen uh, outrageously high temperatures in uh, Finland, in, in Siberia. Again, we expect 
expect uh, more fires uh, up there. We expect uh, Greenland melts. Summer sea ice is definitely melting fast again this year. And and uh, we are certainly seeing more things like zombie fires where fires burn under the permafrost year round. They never go out. And then, of course, as they thaw in, in more towards the summertime, all that, that carbon is released to the air. So, so the COP26 in Glasgow is an absolutely critical point in time where we have to go far beyond the talking and the and the niceties and actually say what exactly are we going to do and and i do think that some of the work uh, the work that was done at the g7 was helpful certainly it is more collaborative Deidre, you're, you're right we do need that collaboration but we do need actually uh, developed countries and, and regions to live up to their promises of 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 giving you know 100 billion uh, us dollars annually to the developing world which has actually been committed since 2009 and just simply never met. So uh, it's science says enough talking, just more action now. And and I guess I'm encouraged to hear Kate to say that, that the Google technologies can help because I believe we need a dashboard for the earth yeah. and we need to use things like Google Maps to really show uh, how that situation room is is kicking off and, and, and what we can do with our actions to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Maybe Diedrich first. Are we doing enough? No, that's very clear. Uh, and as I said, the science is clear on that. Um, we're not doing enough. We are at the moment on a pathway to a, a warming of well uh, beyond above two uh, degrees Celsius, two and a half or even three, uh, which is dangerous. Uh, so we need to do a lot. Uh, and uh, at the moment, I'm seeing, uh, as I said, I'm also optimistic because I see the tide is turning in terms of more action, more innovation, more collaboration, um, and we might get there. But I, I would say we make it tense. Um, it's, it has happened before in, in mankind that uh, we have that tendency of running into a wall, and just before we hit it, we find something to jump over it. Well, this time we are approaching that wall with incredible speed and the wall is pretty high. So it is going to be a tense uh, decade or two decades, to be honest. Um, if it doesn't happen now, it's too late. I've, ideally, I mean, we can keep moderating back to, to Kate and then back to you guys, but theoretically, can we just get a really good debate going in terms of Maybe make, give us suggestions, give us more options. We know that people need to make you know, a lot of the changes, but it's really government. It goes back to what Gail said. Why, why are these promised um, financial resources not flowing? What, why, why are we not doing this? What's happening in politics that they get stuck? I mean, that people need to know about these kinds of things. Maybe we, can, maybe we can have an impact in some way, shape, or form other than what we can do in our personal lives every single day. Any suggestions? Well, Welcome. One, one thing. Please go ahead. One thing I was going to, to share, and I alluded to this a little bit in the opening, is a place where we've seen a tremendous amount of opportunity to work with governments is at the city scale. You know, about mm -hmm. half of the Earth's population live in cities, and they represent about 70% of global emissions. So if we can enable cities to really take climate action in meaningful ways, that's going to have a tremendous positive impact. And what we learned through our... What we've uh, learned through the partnership with the Global Covenant of Mayors uh, through which we built the Environmental Insights Explorer is that when cities don't have the resources, they're not able to set global bold climate targets. And so through this tool, we've given cities open source Google data sets on topics like the solar potential of rooftops, the emissions of their buildings, the emissions of transportation, even in insights around air quality or the ability to bring in urban tree cover. And then you don't have to be a large city with a whole staff of people to set a climate action plan. You can be a much smaller city and still take advantage of this technology to set bold targets. So as I mentioned, we've already rolled this out in about 34 cities across Europe. We're working towards having it in over 3,000 cities and enabling a gigaton of carbon emissions by 2030 to be reduced through these new insights. But I mean, we, we talk about the effects of COVID and I think one of the things we were all so excited about at some point was like, oh my God, you know, carbon reduction has happened. Um, the planet's healing slowly. Water quality has improved. There's dolphins in, in Venice. Um, CO2 emissions are way down. 
Um, and then, you know, rents after the lockdown ended. I think things have gone not just back to where they were before, but we've actually exceeded carbon um, emissions quite drastically because A, shared mobility services obviously were not an issue for people. Personal car ownership rose once again because people thought the safest place to be was to be in their own cars. And now all of these smart urban mobility transport solutions we thought could help us um, are currently at the moment, at least it's not looking that great. So, so what can, for example, the city mayor of Berlin do? I mean, it's like if this is a trend, how can we, do we need to be st more stringent in enforcing things? We can't, you know, what are some of the options? What, what can we do? Well, we can be more, and we should be more uh, um, forceful in enforcing things if needed. But uh, let me end the first half of this uh, panel of doom uh, with an optimistic uh, view of uh, what can happen. And there's three th very important things that are happening out there that will change things for the better. One, and I've already mentioned it, innovation. It's incredible what the cost curves of solar energy and offshore wind and electrical cars have done in the last 10 years. That's really mind-boggling. Uh, thanks to industry, also thanks to governments that have regulated that. There, we have to continue, but we are at the right pace. Second, look at the geopolitical reality at the moment. Only one and a half year ago, we had a completely different president somewhere in the White House, and we didn't hear anything from China, nothing. Now, one and a half year later, which is a minute on a geopolitical timescale, we have a completely different ambition in the White, from the White House, the real one. He has to live up to that, but the, the, the stars are more than promising. And from China, we have an ambition to, to become carbon neutral. Might not be at the right place in time or at the right time on the, on the calendar, but it's a very promising uh, development. And the third, way more, uh, by far the most important, it's our young, young people, it's our kids. They are moving the world forward as, uh, at an, um, as you've never seen before. Um, and you know, in a way that is actually much more important than being in large conference halls uh, with large governmental uh, representations. It's at the kitchen table where they ask questions to their parents, small questions about eating meat, bigger questions about why do we fly to Bali for a holiday when that's not needed, and existential questions. What are you doing, Dad, to save my future? And if that dad happens to be the CEO of Daimler-Benz or a civil servant in the European Commission or somebody else who's working on that, that's an existential question. And I can see that happening all around me. I'm a parent myself, but also talking to other people, you can hear them speak about their own children and the need to, to step up to the plate and do action. I think those three developments that we've seen in the last year or the last five years are going to change the world for the better. So obviously we are at a dangerous spot at the moment. And yes, it is a dawning uh, prospect, but we have all the tools at hand to get out of there political, technological, and in society. Right, but I would like to jump in here. And, you know, I'm a mother and I brought both of my sons as volunteers to Davos and they worked security for Greta and the other uh -huh. teens that were um, uh, uh, protesting uh, in 2020, the last live Davos. So I, I do believe that there's been a, a lot of strengthening of the youth. However, let's not put all of this on uh, their shoulders, which are already going to be facing a lot of challenges uh, in the future. I think it is actually for middle-aged people like us that have power and resources and skills to really step up and be be more brave. And, and I do think there's been good, good, certainly clear uh, movements out of the U.S. Um, and, and, and China and others. But I would like to say that if we take a look at the, the governmental money that's been promised for COVID economic recovery globally, globally, the analysis is by and far, it is not green stimulus packages. And, and that means that we might be locking ourselves into a, 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 um, a high carbon trajectory, right when we've got more money being pumped in to build large infrastructure projects than ever before. So there has to be a reality check in terms of actually what is happening. And I don't want to step around that. I'm a, 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 you know, a stubborn optimist, but we have to look at the doom and gloom. And then we have to get courageous about doing far more than simply what we've been doing in the past. Kate? 
Indeed, I, I, I think that's correct. And we, we are at a critical juncture right now. I think we all agree the science is clear. This is the critical decade for action. And, and I think I, you know, I, I also agree. I am, I am an optimist, although we do face significant challenge. And I really, again, come back to this huge potential role for technology, you know, not only to enable policymakers to have data and insights to set more bold climate targets, um, but also the role of individuals, you know, which we were just talking about a moment ago. And that's where we're really excited to bring our tools and technology to the table at Google. You know, we have this tremendous privilege that we have products that over a billion people use every day. And so if we're able to provide data and insights that are helpful to people in making changes in their lives as they're having those kitchen table conversations that we're all having with our kids at home, we think that's really meaningful. So whether that's when you go to Google Maps and defaulting to the least carbon intensive route, or if you're looking for flights, thinking about where you're going to take that vacation, providing information about the carbon footprint of that flight so that can factor into your decision-making process, bringing a learning thermostat in your home to give you insights every day into how to be more energy efficient at home bringing your kids into those conversations. That's where we feel like there can be tremendous opportunity for individual action in addition to the policymaker front, which is obviously a key piece of the puzzle. Um, Diederich, I know you're very passionate about sort of innovation helping us out along the way. Um, could you please enlighten us a little bit in terms of what the Green Deal was previously until 2020 and what Horizon Europe kind of entails under the Green Deal now and maybe new technologies and startups and, uh, and new innovations can help us uh, along that front. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about that, that'd be great. Well, it is one of the bedrocks of, of our future policies. Obviously, we have that, that thing called the emission trading system, um, the renewable energy directive. But indeed, out there is Horizon 2020, uh, which is now moving into the new horizon for the future, which is approximately 100 billion euros in uh, investments in research and technology, making new things happen. Um, I'm not sure whether the European Union is the best partner in uh, spurring innovation, uh, but it's a very solid one uh, and a big one. Um, so it should be, um, uh, and we take that responsibility in, in moving things forward. And, and to be honest, if um, just before I took up my life and went to Brussels to make the Green Deal happen, uh, I worked in the private sector for a few years, uh, looking for investments opportunities for big investors. And I found them all over the place in, in sheds in Bratislava, where basically uh, where a, a young a group of young people are working on perovskite and the new holy grail material of the new generation of solar cells, or in Warsaw or Gdansk. And I'm deliberately mentioning Eastern European countries because it's not often uh, sort of connected to innovation, but actually there's more innovation happening over there than is happening in Western Europe at the moment. And that's promising. Those young people, they, they want to conquer the world. They want to improve the world. They're working on solid state battery technology. They're working on those huge innovations that we need uh, to embark on a sustainable pathway for our economy. Um, and we're going to support that wherever we can. Um, the Green Deal is, is going to go nowhere without this innovative investments. And I, just to add, you know, I, I think this is critical. The, and what we have been really thinking about is not only how do we put Google's technology behind the European Green Deal, behind innovation in Europe, but also how do we how do we enable other smaller companies? Exactly what Teacher is talking about. So we last year launched a Google.org Impact Challenge where we uh, solicited for. Uh, innovative companies across Europe that were working to be a part of the green recovery, building a resilient future for Europe. And we were able to provide about 10 million euros of grants um, to companies that are, do or to organizations that are doing really innovative work in Europe. And, and just a couple of my favorite examples are organizations like Open Climate Fix. They're using short-term solar electricity forecasting 
at with machine learning and satellite data to bring more efficient and regular solar to the grid, or normative who are working to help um, companies reduce their carbon f- footprint through financial reporting and especially enabling small businesses to do carbon accounting. So these kind of innovative com- organizations are going to be really critical as well. And, and we also really want to play a role in fostering that ecosystem. I, I love staying optimistic and I'm, 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 I'm a huge fan, but, but Gail, I just think it's fascinating because you do bring us back to earth uh, in, in the sense of reality checks. And what I would love to spend the last five minutes that I have with the three of you on, we will close on an optimistic note. Obviously things are great, but if you guys had a magic wand and you had you know, wishes to come true, um, what would they be? And if we, if we need to move outside of the EU and, and our COP26 discussion right now, please feel free to do so. Um, I'd love your wish list. Maybe start with Gail. Yeah, well, my wish list is uh, no more fossil fuel development globally. Full stop. And I'll couple that by uh, scaling up EVs by 20 times where we currently are. We've seen the success that Norway has, has, and government subsidies do make a difference. And if you do that, the the market will tip. So I'll go with those two and my magic wand. (laughs) Brilliant. Whoever wants to go first, Kate Diedrich. Sure. I, I say, I, you know, my wish is is very relevant to the topic of discussion today. I think it's radical collaboration. I think we need deep collaboration between industry, between science, between government. Sort of exactly what we're talking about on this panel today. Uh, all of us coming together to really take action in this decisive decade as individuals, as businesses, as policymakers. That is my, that is my wish for us. All right, Diedrich, now you're in the hot seat because you're, you're going to be the man here that can hopefully make this happen. So, so is, there, <laughs> is there something uh, that, that we can do on the commission level? I'm not going to put a thing on the wish list that is within my control because I shouldn't wish that, I should just make that happen, which is the Green Deal and everything we can do within Europe. But on my wish list is real solidarity with the rest of the world. We haven't shown enough of that. If you look at uh, a continent like Africa, which is our southern neighbor, uh, it seems that it sometimes lives in a different galaxy, or at least as we are uh, as concerned and not caring enough about what happens there. We can see that right now with a vaccination strategy where we all take care of ourselves before handing out one vaccine to people that can't afford it, to buy it or to make it. Um, Gail already, Uh, jumped upon and rightly so the money that was promised that is never transferred uh, so far so the only way we can uh, manage this on on spaceship earth is if we consider ourselves part of the same spaceship Uh, and real solidarity is i think the conditio sine qua non for making this happen so if i would put one thing on top of my wish list and that needs to happen in glasgow um it's real commitment to help each other to make this happen. Um, I mean, industry is doing what it, what it can. I mean, the automotive industry is definitely, you know, it's, it's working on electrification and things like that. How can we, do, do we need to do more incentivization of industry to get them to move even faster? What is it going to take? I mean, you know, it, they're at, a, they're at a crossroads. They, you know, they think, no, well, we need to go electric, but people aren't buying electric because the infrastructure isn't there and the infrastructure isn't there. You know. So it's a, a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of a blame game where people want it, but they can't really use the technology. What can we do on a, on a policy side to, to foster that more? Does it need more money? I mean, it's like it seems to be the answer for everything is just throw more money at it, but that's obviously not enough and it's not helping. But is that an option? Well, it's certainly an option, but it's not the best one. In this case, for car and mobility strategy, I think we have mastered the trick. Uh, The CO2 emission standards for cars are gradually going down to zero, which is effectively the funeral of the internal combustion engine. And it will happen very soon. And as you say, it will only happen if at the same time we create regulation, and that's, well, I wouldn't say easy, but we can do that to uh, create the right infrastructures, charging points at homes, at businesses, 
and in between uh, along the along the roads. Um, and if we do that at the same time, you break the chicken and egg problem, and change will happen. Uh, Norway let us uh, show us the way how to do that. That's obviously a, an incredibly rich country, so it's not by coincidence that they are first, but we can follow them, uh, and we can follow them suit, and we will. And this is just one example where you can turn around a whole industrial ecosystem towards sustainability. And next is the steel sector, and next is the cement and fertilizers, the big industries that all have to change radically, that have to transform themselves. There's a lot of chicken and egg problems in there that we can tackle as governments by putting the right regulation at the right time. Perfect. Gail, we will stop fossil fuels right now, <laughs> globally. I wish I, could, I wish I could help make that happen. Um, it's been an absolute delight. It's been a pleasure ending um, the Green Tech Festival today with the three of you. Thank you for not just being trailblazers, but change makers and inspiring all of us to do the best we can for a sustainable future. It's been a delight. Um, thank you so much. All the best to you. And, uh, and thank you for your time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. And this is the final closing of the Green Tech Festival. It's time for me to bring Felix back out here to, uh, to send you all farewell and, and off into the early evening. Um, it's been a pleasure and take care. <laughs>